obviously you folks are here because you enjoy hearing about art, you enjoy dial the dialogue of contemporary art and, and obviously the content and the issues. Uh, please think of the UWM Artists Now series as your series as well. It's, uh, it's obviously it's a free and a free a, a series that's open to the public. It, uh, we have guests every Wednesday night, artists from around the country, uh, around the world. We celebrate local artists. Normal Raja is presenting tonight at 7.30. Uh, we have 300 plus seats in that auditorium and 150 are taken up by students. And so uh, there's plenty of room for you is what I'm trying to say. So if you go to the uh, UWM Peck School of the Arts website under Artists Now, you can see the entire calendar and see which talks um, uh, interest you. And that happens almost every Wednesday night. Uh, there's some gaps. Sometimes we, we don't fill every single day, but every fall, every spring semester know that we are bringing in incredible artists from all over the world. So uh, please think of that as your uh, series as well. That that's, uh, could be on your agenda. Uh, it's in uh, the Arts Center Lecture Hall, ACL 120. It's the standalone building between uh, Mitchell Hall and uh, the theater building. And so Wednesday night, 7.30. Uh, free and open to the public. It doesn't feel like a class uh, when you walk in. It, it feels like you're going into the student union. Um, so uh, I was asked to talk about Sam Durant's work. And I don't know Sam personally. I know a lot of artists that do, uh, that cross paths with him in Los Angeles, who have worked uh, with him. Uh, I actually became really inspired by him because he used his, res uh, his resources and connections in the quote art world to uh, help Emory Douglas publish his book of the revolutionary art that he's done with the Black Panther Party. And I was always floored that an artist who had his own art career and was known for his own images uh, also had this other practice as well that in this case really merged into uh, curating. Uh, so I appreciate that Sculpture Milwaukee brought Sam Durant's work to town. And I want to talk, um, I really want to talk about uh, about text in art. I'm going to show a, a number of artists, not just Sam's work, uh, that use primarily text as the driving force of how they're communicating. And I also want to talk a lot about the power of words. And so I will move quickly past the work that you folks might be familiar with, uh, the work that you perhaps have seen uh, that he did. Uh, I would, make the, I would uh, make the case that some people might uh, walking by this might not know that this is the work of a relatively famous contemporary artist. They see this. Uh, it reminds one of the signs you see uh, in demonstrations. Uh, some of these quotes might resonate for you, uh, to you. Certainly, we are the ones we've been uh, waiting for. It's been used in a lot of demonstrations, a lot of signs, a lot of uh, hope for optimism. And as far as I know, that, comes, that, that quote comes from the late Grace Lee Boggs, who's one of the great activists of, of, uh, out of Detroit for decades and decades, and one of the great optimists. So if you're not familiar with Grace Lee Boggs' work, uh, by all means, uh, look up her work and her vision. Um, so I'm going to loop back to uh, Sam Durant's piece here, and I think you'll see the connections. Uh, you folks probably know Sam Durant's name from the scaffold piece. Uh, the controversy at the Walker Art Museum a couple years ago. Uh, there's not a semester that doesn't go by in my teaching where I'm not assigning essays about this work uh, because I think it's a really important moment in uh, public art, but it's a really important moment now. Um, Sam Durant created this piece called Scaffold. Uh, it had been shown in other cities. It had been shown uh, in, in Germany, uh, the Walker Art Center when they were redoing, uh, their, their sculpture garden, they commissioned for a couple hundred thousand dollars Sam Durant to build scaffold. Uh, this was at the same time, around the same time, of the, the No Dakota Access Pipeline struggle, the No Dapple uh, Pipeline, which I went out there for a week and screen printed and was very engaged in you know, trying to give solidarity to that native-led struggle. Uh, obviously, over 300 plus Native nations came together to fight this pipeline. So in the consciousness in uh, many people's minds, especially when you're talking about Minnesota and North Dakota, uh, that struggle was very much in the forefront of people's thinking. Uh, also, that was a struggle that likely would have been won had Trump not been elected. Uh, the uh, Obama put a, put a basically a block 
on the permitting that, that was needed. And the second Trump took office, that was one of the first things uh, that he, re uh, he reversed. So this sculpture uh, became very contentious and very controversial um, due to its meaning and specifically due to its location. What S Sam Durant was talking about in this work is it was representing seven gallows, hanging gallows, uh, representing state-sponsored executions uh, by the U.S. government. It was representing the hanging of John Brown in 1859. It was representing the hanging of the Chicago anarchists, which obviously brought us May Day. And also one of the representations of it was the largest ma mass execution in U.S. history, which took place during the Lincoln administration in 1862 when uh, 38 Dakota Native people were executed uh, by the state. Um, and this sculpture, uh, situated in Minneapolis with one of the largest urban Native populations and coincidentally on Dakota land, uh, that Dakota still claim right to this, uh, became very problematic to them. Um, this is the representat representation of the hanging in 1862 but when this sculpture was being put up and erected, this is the types of signage and demonstrations that was happening uh, outside of the walker. Signs such as, take it down, 200,000 uh, reward for scalp of the artist, feels like 1862. Um, all of a sudden, the artist, and by extension, uh, the museum, was in a very, very tricky place. Um, and it raises really interesting questions, and it raises questions that I share with my students when um, I'm teaching public art, when I'm teaching community art. What should the artist do when their work causes trauma, when it causes trauma to people in the community? Uh, should the work of art be removed? Should the artist slash the museum apologize? Uh, my answer to that is it's really site specific. I've, heard, I've had some debates uh, with artists, even art, local artists, who say the artist should never apologize. They take down their work, they are being cowardly, censoring art is a bad thing. Uh, in my mind, it's site-specific, and it's really specific to uh, the situation. So here's the situation that the artist Sam Durant and the director of the Walker at the time, Olga Visa, found themselves in, uh, in not just a controversy uh, dealing directly with the Dakota, but this is one of those rare moments where an art controversy became, quote, front page news. And I think when I said uh, I want to focus tonight's presentation on, on words and text, I actually think Sam Durant's words and how he handled this controversy are some of the most commendable um, things I could ever say about him. And I think he handled it uh, in a really thoughtful and respectful manner. And I'll read uh, what, he, what his, his reaction to it is. Uh, Sam Durant uh, said, I'm reading some quotes, because uh, there was a backlash, too. There were people saying, don't take your work down, don't let yourself be censored. Uh, there was also actually a racist backlash, too, where uh, people were saying, we're not going to listen to the Native community. Uh, we're going to keep the sculpture up. Why should we listen to them? And Sam Durant said, I always hoped my work would be in support of Native American struggles and justice. To hear that I was harming them, I felt terrible. I had to change it. So Sam Durant and the museum met with Dakota, the Dakota, Dakota elders. They met in June of 2017. And um, this is what Sam decided. He said, he decided that the work would come down, but moreover, the work, the, the copyright, the intellectual rights of the piece would be signed over to the Dakota people so it would never be built again. So it was taken down, removed, and the Dakota did a ceremonial bur a burning of this piece. It's really a remarkable uh, moment in public art history and a really remarkable moment in museums. And, but Sam uh, Durant's quotes are really instructive because uh, they're so honest and, and uh, uh, straightforward. He said, the museum, and I'm sharing the blame, didn't reach out to the community. We didn't think of it, to start a dialogue before we started building it. 
There was no information for the community. Essentially, the community, all of a sudden they saw a blank you know, lawn, and then they saw this. Um, he writes, then it turns out that the garden is located on historic Dakota land. So you couldn't have had a better test case of white ignorance in one place. He also said, uh, and I'll read just a few more quotes, he said, when he met with the Dakota elder, it was in a ceremonial circle. From their perspective, it was a spiritual session and not a political one, which allowed for a certain kind of dialogue. Maybe a more open and honest one, but it was very emotional. I tried to explain a bit what the work was about, but I felt I should be listening. So that's what I tried to do. The main issue was how real the structure was for them. That was the main point. The elders were very calm and respectful and thoughtful, but also passionate about their view. As long as that structure was up, it would continue to remind them of what had been there. They asked me to take it down, and I agreed. I think that's powerful uh, words. And, I, and to me, that's one of the more powerful things perhaps this artist has ever done in his career. Uh, much more powerful than the work that's down in downtown Milwaukee. It's how he handled um, this art controversy. And art controversies, I think they're, they're, uh, there's some standard things. Obviously, the museum and the artist should have done their homework. They should have reached out to the community. They should have understand the exact location. Uh, but I think they're, they're specific to certain places, and there, there's not one-size-fits-all solution to each, to each case. And I think in this case, they handled it incredibly well. But what I think is so surprising is that the museum itself um, didn't take the first action in thinking about putting this high-profile piece, not knowing that something like that would really register with the Dakota people with that history that was so rooted there, and especially with all the discussion about native rights and native, native sovereignty. The museum, more so, didn't know its own history as well, in my mind, where they had commissioned artists, native artists, who were talking about the exact same piece in a much different perspective from a native perspective. Uh, Edgar Heap of Birds, the Cheyenne Arapaho artist, uh, whose work some of you might know, had done a famous piece in the early 90s on the banks of the Mississippi in downtown Mississippi, where he put a, a sign in honor of each person who was hung uh, it, in the McCando, McCando hangings in um, 1862, honoring their name, honoring the fact that many of these people were, were hung with no justice whatsoever. Some of, some of the people who were hung weren't, were just hung because of their leadership roles as the U.S. government and white settlers were moving westward. So Edgar Heapabird's signs right here really puts forth a native perspective, but it's fascinating that this same theme resurfaces in Sam Durant's work um, you know, a, a couple decades later. Um, I find um, Edgar Heapabird's work really fascinating and really important. And the signs that he's put up uh, all over the continent, uh, all over the world. He is very famous and very well known for putting text-based signs. Uh, these signs that are up in multiple locations around the continent uh, remind us that we are all standing on native land. We are standing on Potawatomi land as, as I speak. We're standing on Menominee land. He reminds the, his audience that today your host is wherever the sign is located, in this case, British Columbia. And you can see he puts uh, the, 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 word, the naming of the colonizer going backwards. It's a really powerful public intervention. It's a really powerful uh, mode of communicating. But I also think the language of, of stating today your host is really, um, really important in the, the power of words. This was one of the few signs I know that was vandalized and taken down. Obviously, uh, the pattern and the history of universities naming uh, their teams and their mascots uh, after um, uh, native people or histories. Um, and that is still a wound on that campus to the point that this was one of the very few signs that he had created that, well, that had been vandalized. When you're talking about word-based art, um, 
there's a massive distinction between art that's done in the art world in a traditional uh, framework uh, that is shown in the gallery or through an arts organization versus work that's shown in the streets. Um, I'm sharing with you uh, work from the Overpass Light Brigade and also sharing work from two of my colleagues. This is a project that grew out of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, grew out of this city. Uh, it, was, it began during the Wisconsin Uprising in 2010 by an English professor, Lane Hall, and a design professor, Lisa Moline. Uh, they wanted to take protest and signs into the night. Uh, especially during the height of the Wisconsin Uprising as Walker was assaulting the rights of public employees and just about everything else uh, the state holds, uh, uh, cherishes. And the OLB uh, essentially made light bright signs. And they would gather people on the tops of overpasses who would each hold a light to the, to the um, now people who hold the lights are called holders of the light. They recognize that uh, the law said as long as you weren't adhering these signs uh, to these fences, you have freedom of speech to do this. Now, OLB, um, besides doing a lot of their actions locally in Milwaukee and Madison, they put this idea out for others to emulate and to copy. And there's, what, 40 to 50 chapters globally of the OLB all over the world. Um, what I find so fascinating about this, this work is it, uh, it hits you from a visceral, visceral level when you see it, when you drive under one of these, whether you agree with the slogan, the politics or not, you're forced to confront it. So I know when I've passed by these and I see a sign that says there's no planet B, uh, I'm inspired that others are putting that message out. Yet to those who are opposing these messages, it reminds you that there's many people fighting for, these type, for, the, for uh, this type of justice as well. Also, I think this work lends itself to the camera and it lends itself to social media. Um, the, it's incredibly photo, photographic. Um, OLB is always reaching out to great photographers like Joe Brusky and many others. Kevin has photographed OLB actions. Uh, and then this work is further de de uh, disseminated uh, through the internet. Uh, I have seen OLB's uh, images on the front pages of newspapers and leading stories uh, globally for years and years. And I think it's interesting, too, what these two artists have done. Um, first, they really, they really reshaped their practice towards activism. They reshaped their practice towards struggles and working with many people. They also thought about some people don't want to get arrested and um, do direct action, but they're more comfortable doing this type of work, which is completely was very necessary. And then if you look at their practice, Lisa Moline is a designer, and Lane went from the printmaking department into English, and really understanding the power of words. So a lot of thought goes into what these messages are, and I always think it's fascinating to see them come up with slogans and then to talk about which slogans are working and which ones aren't and which ones really resonate. But the fact that they made this something that uh, many people across the country and world could use this technique and bring it into their struggles I think is vital. The next artist I want to share with you who creates uh, text-based art, art is uh, the Philadelphia-based artist Michelle Angelo Ortiz. We had Michelle come present at Artists Now, what, maybe two years ago. Uh, she was Raul Deal's guest. One of the most incredible Artists Now talks I've ever seen. Uh, she just won a very prestigious Rauschenberg uh, Award and is really on the front lines of using her art to fight for immigrant rights and to speak against uh, the deport, uh, deportation and the mass incarceration of immigrants. This word-based piece is remarkable because it was a permission-based piece. She went all the way up to the mayor's office and spoke directly with the mayor of Philadelphia and got permission from the city to do this piece. And the, the location of this piece was right in front of ICE, right in front of Immigration Custom Enforcement. Uh, it was so contentious to them that they would not allow um, her to obviously utilize their building to take a photograph. They had to rent a crane uh, to even take this photograph. But this stayed on the streets for months. 
And the text, the, 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 the um, motive behind it is powerful. Uh, this was uh, put in front of the ICE building in Philly, Philadelphia on October 12th, 2015. And she writes, as ICE agents looked on, I led the installation with volunteers and families from Wantos, an immigrant rights organization based in Philadelphia. The 90 words came from Anna, an undocumented mother who was detained with her daughter at the Berks County Family Prison in Pennsylvania. Anna's words were placed at the exit point where detained loved ones are transported to jails and prisons. Uh, I've shared this work with uh, Christine Newman Ortiz, uh, obviously the director of Voces, uh, uh, Voces de la Frontera, which is hands down one of the most power powerful immigrant rights groups uh, in the entire country, obviously based right here in Walker's Point with nine different chapters across the state. And she shared this with the Voces community and she said, this is what we're fighting for. We're fighting for our families, we're fighting for our loved ones, we want these stories to become part of the national uh, narrative. And of course, Christine being Christine said, when are we doing this in Milwaukee? When are we putting this out in the streets? So the last project I want to segue before looping back to Sam's work and hearing your thoughts on this is much like the work that Lane Hall and Lisa Moline are doing uh, with OLB, uh, you're seeing a shift where a lot of talented artists are focusing much of their time not necessarily on their quote art career, not necessarily on a path uh, to stardom in galleries and museums, but working directly in the community and teaming up with the organizations and the groups that are doing key work on the ground. A number of us, including myself, helped form this group called Voces de los Artistas, uh, which was formed a couple days after uh, Trump was elected president where we recognized that the stakes were going to get a lot um, higher and that the attacks on vulnerable communities, especially immigrant communities, uh, were going to get a lot more intense quickly. So what we did is we modeled an affinity group after ACT UP. As many of you know about the ACT UP history and the Grand Fury Design Collective that used design almost second to none. When we think of all the iconic uh, AIDS slogans and graphics, that was done by a handful of people, a dozen, uh, 20 people working in collectives like Grand Fury who did design work on par of million dollar design firms and they did everything for the struggle. It wasn't necessarily for the gallery or the museum, although much of that work did wind up there in the years and decades to follow. It was for the movement itself. So right after uh, the 2016 election, uh, we met at, with Christine, and many of us had been uh, part of VOSAs, volunteered, done art for VOSAs for many, many years. We said, we have to up our organizing tactics, and we started an affinity group. And this affinity group now has over 60 artists of many different disciplines, from videographers, photographers, graphic designers, painters, and muralists, that are part of VOSAs. And whenever our lead communication person, VOSAs, says, we need something. Uh, we need something for tomorrow. We need a banner for May Day. They have incredible designers that can throw down and work for them. So uh, for free, mind you. Um, so when uh, Vosis marched on Waukesha, and Waukesha didn't know what hit them, because they got hit with the largest May Day march in their history, perhaps the largest march in Waukesha's history. It was, Waukesha was chosen because uh, the sheriff of that county uh, was attempting to deputize police uh, officers to be ICE agents. And so Christine and Vosas recognized that at that moment the struggle uh, had to be situated in downtown Waukesha. And so when the May Day march happened, uh, one of the things the Art Affinity Group did is paint not all, but many of the banners. And the artists that you had working on these were artists uh, who have dedicated their life to design and are putting all their energy into this. So a 100-yard banner marched through the streets of Waukesha that said they tried to bury us. Uh, they didn't realize we were just seeds. The famous, uh, obviously, Mexican proverb. Uh, designers in the group include people like Raul Deal, who are designing these unbelievable parachute banners that are 24 feet wide and brought into the state capitol when thousands of petitions were then delivered to then Governor Walker. Uh, many of my students ask questions, how can I help? What can I do? 
I feel powerless. Use your talents for the struggle. And people like Claudio Martinez, who was at one point a uh, freshman student in one of my classes, is now one of the best designers working anywhere on any movements and creating parachutes like this. Um, I get inspiration every day when I look at artists I admire across the country, artists like Fabiana Rodriguez, whose work exists in many, many uh, locations, galleries, museums, but by and large in the streets. And when we reach out to Fabiana and say, uh, the teachers in Oakland are striking, um, they love your art, can we use it? She said, of course. My fee is nothing. Put this work in the, in the movement and amplify it. Um, all this work is text-based work. And it takes us to a, uh, a transition to Sam Durant's work, too. That's text-based. Uh, the messages are powerful. They're hopeful. Uh, empathy for everyone. Uh, what I assume to be the Grace Lee Boggs work uh, message, we are the ones we've been waiting for. But my question with this work, and I'd like to throw it open to you and your thoughts, is uh, we all see art differently. It all speaks to us differently. Uh, we don't know, in many cases, when we put work out into the public, how people are going to react to it. Uh, people might react to this work and it completely brightens their day, or they take a photo of it and share it, or this is the message I needed to hear, or perhaps they're walking by it and it's not even registering that much. Uh, we don't know. Just like Sam Durant and the Walker did not know uh, the controversy, they should have perhaps known, but they didn't know what was going to happen uh, when that controversy erupted in Minneapolis. Uh, I think they handled it, personally, I think they handled it the right way. But what's missing here when you look at this image? People. It's the first thing I would say. To me, the power of these signs and these messages are the people holding them. When you think about the signs of the suffrage movement in the 19-teens, the power is the messages, but the power is the women holding those signs. And so as much as I think this work is interesting, and I'm certainly not, not here to uh, eviscerate the work, I think we should understand um, its context. And perhaps he's trying to make us think of uh, this work outside of its context, removed from the people holding it, but largely removed from the movement. And one thing I'm trying to make clear is I think being largely removed from the mov movement uh, could be problematic uh, because you are not aligning creative people with the struggles of our time and the true crisis that we're faced, politically, economically, and especially environmentally. Um, and so I appreciate this work. I think it's important. I commend Sculpture Milwaukee uh, for, uh, for hosting this work. I'm, I'm curious, and I don't know the answer to this, if Sam Durant has started to self-censor himself a little bit after what happened in Minnesota, if he's trying to be a little safer. Um, that, I'm not necessarily saying this work is completely safe, uh, but what's not at risk here is the risk you're seeing here. And certainly the people that are threatened with deportation or those on the front lines of climate. But I'm not necessarily saying that that's the role that all art should take. Uh, art communicates in many different ways, and the fact that this work is downtown and communicating uh, very hopeful messages, very progressive messages, maybe are making more people think. Uh, we do need more empathy. We do need to feel more empowered and to feel that everyone's voice matters, especially when you come together. But I do find it ironic that the first thing I said is what's missing here. First thing I heard was people. What was your reaction when you, I got a little bit of time, I do have to run in about 10 minutes to get up to UWM. But I'm really curious what your reaction was when you first saw Sam Durant's work uh, downtown. I love the simplicity without people. Reference to everyone. It's beyond a group. It is everyone because mm -hmm. we all are affected. I think what is important is the mass that we recognize. Mm -hmm. But then we have to recognize the closer to the mass. So it, it really plays with the mind in a very interesting way. Hopefully, we're right. very attractive. Right. So, and it's, I work out as a Y. 
Yeah. And that's in the Flankington building. Right. I also come at 8 o'clock in the mornings or 8.15 so I can get a parking space. I parked right in front of that one day and I thought, wait a minute, what is this? Is this some kind of sign in the Grand Ave? I mean, I didn't really get it. And then I just stood there and I looked and I, and I felt it. And furthermore, I don't know if people know this, there are homeless people, there are mentally ill people that are standing in the doorway as I go in to the Plankington. And I thought, empathy for everyone. I felt it so deeply because sometimes I go and I don't want to confront the person, I don't want to look at them. And there they are, standing there. And then we are the ones that can solve this, hopefully. But it blew me away the first time I saw it. And I took pictures and I posted it on my Facebook. But I think it's very profound and furthermore, you know, because it's in the building that is being revived and there are, uh, and then contrasted, there are people that are. Right. Well, as you stand there, your reflection is in it. Yes, and that too. You are reflecting. That is a good point. Your reflection that black composite behind it flat. Excellent. Uh, yeah. I just thought when I first saw it, saw it, I thought, especially the empathy for everyone, it would have been nice to have like a border of real people's picture at least that would, you know, really make it stand out. The colors on the other one gives you more um, sass that a border with people's faces, different cultures and everything. You know, with people harder. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm hearing, uh, and I'm sure there's a whole wide range of reactions to it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of art gives you a lot of uh, avenues to enter, and I, and the artists in the room know this. When you add slogans to it, you somewhat close off those avenues because you're framing it. But the, these choices and the words they chose to um, to put up. Uh, they resonate. Mm -hmm. They resonate with people. Um, and so, uh, you know, just taking the temperature of this room, uh, he, he's made a, a difference and an impact with this work. Yeah. For me, it, it really cheered me that they were part of the Sculpture Milwaukee collection because it made me think of signs I've seen at demonstrations. And, and it kind of broadened this out from being just that a visual experience and, and had me make associations with it. And I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. yes. I was just thinking of the play I read in high school with the first one, Waiting for Godot. Uh -huh. And we are the ones who are waiting for But I wanted to ask a question too. Sure. Sam Duran's first piece that was the scaffolding. Yep. Do you have an idea of what his purpose, goal, reason? in the, its creation and assembling it? I, I do, because I've taught, I've taught that, that, about that work to many classes. And he's doing exactly what's happening in this room. He wants to raise um, uh, important issues in society and get people talking about it. And he wanted the public to talk about capital punishment. And so that piece was meant to uh, spark a larger dialogue on capital punishment essentially the death penalty, but the use of mass execution and the, and the use of the state uh, putting people to death. And he wanted that discussion, really a uh, investigation of history, when you look at what he was uh, commenting about. But uh, what he did recognize, or perhaps what the museum felt, is that that, oh, that that history is incredibly painful and traumatic for the people in that community, the Dakota, to see. And for them, it was uh, a reminder of a great uh, atrocity that was uh, was done against them, and that, in my mind, wasn't necessarily listening to the community. And we've had these incidents happen in our city. Uh, the Adam Stoner mural in the Black Cat uh, Black Cat Alley uh, uh, was meant to have a deeper discussion about mass incarceration and systemic racism, but for many. Uh, for many African Americans, and not all, certainly what there was, there's no blanket way of, of, of talking about this. 
that was a traumatic image, and why do we have to be visualized as uh, prisoners? And why is that in that specific location? So Milwaukee had its own very, and Adam was similar. I, I know Adam because he's a graduate school student, or was a graduate student at UWM, he just graduated. But he was like, the last thing in the world he wanted to do was his art to cause pain. And the quotes that I read to you from Sam Durant, I think are really paying a broader picture of who he is as a person. And we can see his art. We can see that he leaves avenues open for his audience to come to their own terms. But we, we truly don't understand the artists without reading what their thoughts are. And I find his, uh, the way he responded to that controversy um, just really profound and really honest and um, uh, you know, something that, that gave, uh, gave me a lot of respect for him. And in, if, if I, in, I might state that that public art piece, and we could argue if it's public or not, on the walker, did a lot of things wrong. Uh, the reaction, the way it was handled, did a lot of things right. Uh, and I think it's a really important teaching tool. It's one of the reasons why students of mine read it every semester. And uh, the director, who consequently got, lost her job, uh, wrote an essay called Learning in Public. And um, it's a powerful, you can find her essay online, Olga Visa, uh, uh, Learning in Public. But um, <coughs> I have a couple more minutes. Any more thoughts? In, in this room you'd like to share. I, I too walked the length of Wisconsin Avenue one day in July, just looking at all the arts, and, and I, when I saw that, I stopped and wondered if that was part of the sculpture Milwaukee or not initially, and then I thought, I really applauded them for including that kind, mm -hmm. of, that kind of art. So, and it made me think more about how they, how they make the selections Yes. I'm reminded of another artist who uh, ended up uh, doing a, a, what do you call it, a hyper-realist sculpture, super-real sculpture mm -hmm. of a guy in his tidy whites, a sleepwalker, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it caused trauma to the community that viewed it. And I think, I remember reading, I didn't dive into it too much, but I could sort of understand when the artist said, if this causes you pain and trauma, Maybe you should seek therapy. Maybe you should find a little inner strength. And to be able to confront these things as simple as a middle-aged white guy kind of balding, in walk, sleepwalking in his underwear. Right. Well, again, each case is site-specific. It's site-specific to the art. It's site-specific to the city and the community, because each community has its own histories as well. So I think the lesson from uh, Durant sculptures, we can't paint with a broad brush and say this is the, the response every time. But in that case, in that city, at that moment, under those circumstances, with what he was putting forth, what the museum was putting forth, uh, the, I think the reaction is powerful and justified. Uh, it differs with each, each city, each case, and each history. That one seems a lot more benign. If you ask me. But I just remember the, the response of the artist saying, you should seek help. You should try and get past this. I mean, we've all gone at our traumas through life. We've all, some of us have gone to see therapists, tried to get past it mm -hmm. through some form of therapy. And I was curious about your thoughts on the artist's response to that situation. Or anybody's for that matter. It's kind of for all the people that don't get the church. I know, I was thinking I about that. else. Yes, it was a woman's campus. Right. There are just all these issues of the right? So the context, I think, was everything with that piece. And that piece, it was later put on the high line, and I don't think there was a problem with it there. Uh, Agreed. And like all art, it gets us talking, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad we, were, we got to all talk tonight and hear from you. Um, I really applaud Sculpture Milwaukee. Thank you for the work you did. Nice.